Suspense, which is usually heard at this hour on Thursday nights, is taking its customary summer holiday. Suspense returns to the air two weeks from tonight, on Thursday, September 1st. You are standing at the doorway of a cabin on Cashier Creek. Upon the ridge, the bloodhounds have caught your scent, and between you and a fortune, between you and escape, yawn the white jaws of a deadly cottonmouth. We offer you Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape to the worn-out acres of a poor farm somewhere in the southern mountains with Irvin S. Cobb's great tale of vengeance, Snake Doctor. Far back in the southern mountains, it's quiet and hot and lonely. One pine scarred hill is very much like the next, and one winding creek differs little from another. The area through which Cashier Creek twisted was the same as all the rest, except for the snakes. Deadly, venomous, cottonmouths, moccasins. There are probably more snakes along Cashier Creek than anywhere else. Most people lived in constant, deadly fear of these snakes, but there was one man who even seemed to like them. A man they called Snake Doctor. His cabin was near the creek bottom where the cottonmouths were the commonest. And he earned his meager living by rendering down their soft fats, bottling their oil, and selling it. Snake Doctor seemed harmless enough, but there was one man who believed he was a colleague of the devil, who hated him, because he wasn't afraid of the snakes. This man was Jafe Mourner, the Snake Doctor's nearest neighbor. Jafe was that dangerous kind of man who suspected, feared, and hated anything he didn't understand. And he understood neither Cottonmouths nor the snake doctor. Jafe was ornery, ignorant, and shiftless. He'd rather shoot squirrels and chop cotton. He'd rather fish than hoe corn. And that's what he's doing now. Fishing down at the big hole with his son and heir, Finney, who's old enough but not quite bright enough to handle a gun. Missed him, doggy. Finney, you blame fool. I told you not to touch my gun. Trump on him, Pop, before he gets in the creek. What? Huh? The cotton mouth. What? Trump on him in front of you. The cotton mouth. Uh, the vomit. The unugly vomit. You got it, uh, Paul. Uh, Keep your foot on him. We'll stop at your stick. Uh, uh, you don't need to, son. He's dead. Now come here. Paul, how'd he hit anything with that rifle? I had a beat draw right on him, and you I. You done fool. Do that for Paul. Stirring up that filthy snake whilst I'm a fishing. Heck, he was sunning himself not more than two feet from you. He was just two feet from you. Never mind that kind of talk. Won't be no fish around here till thunderation after all that racket. Well, come on, let's go home and get us some vittles. Jafe Morn had tossed his bait can into the creek and threw a stick after it. He stood there watching the stick drift slowly toward the big hole where the creek widened behind a jam of driftwood. Jafe watched as the eddy caught the stick and sucked it beneath the dam. Jafe was curious. He moved downstream a rod or two and waited, watching the water boil up from under the driftwood. But the stick didn't come up. That was strange. It must have caught under there in a tangle of water-soaked and sunken logs. Probably it had stayed there for months. Perhaps stay there always. Let's get some bills, Paul. Jafe thought about this, and an idea began to form in his slow mind as he and Finney started for home. How much oil you reckon's in this, and Paul? Daddy? What you jawing about? This old cotton man. How much oil you reckon? Throw it in? down. Throw it down? Why for? I'm going to Throw land. it down like I say. Oh. I was aiming on rendering the old cottonmouth's fat like the snake doctor does. I was in the cellar and make myself some money. 
I don't like the squirm of things around me. But it's dead. Leave it where it dropped. You scared on cotton mats, Pa? I know better than to get myself bit by him. Pip Bailey know the fella got himself bit one. We were in a drap of liquor for miles. So he goes to work and he cuts open a live chicken. And he put on his leg where the bite was. Fella lived, too. Uh. Reckon Mr. Rives ever gets himself bit? I mean, handling cotton mouth like he does? Who? Mr. Rives. Who? Mr. Rives. That's old Snake Doctor's real name. Ma says I ought and call him Snake Doctor. Never mind what your ma says. Nobody in my family's calling no snake-loving scum Mr. Rives. Heck, that's what I say. All right. Could have made myself some money renting that cottonmouth fat down in the oil. I t- How much you reckon old snake doctor makes out in the oil he sells? I don't know. Pip Bailey says old snake doctor's got more than a thousand dollars hid away somewhere in his cabin. More than that, most likely. Cuss it, old miser don't spend nothing. Ain't got nothing save that rack of bones mare his. Pip Bailey says... Whenever old Snake Doctor sets foot out in his place, he's got the granddaddy of all cotton mouths that he leaves out in the cabin to stand guard over his money. Yeah. Tip Bailey says he'd see old Snake Doctor put him in his pocket. Live ones, too. Snake Doctor ain't fitting to be live himself. Ma says he ain't so bad. Says he don't mean nobody harm. Your ma better be careful who she's associating with. She says he just don't have good sense. Had the fever too much. Daddy? You ever been in Snake Doctor's place? I don't have nothing more than I have to to do with that snake-loving hoodoo. Dip Bailey says he bet it wouldn't be no task at all for some no good to poke around the Snake Doctor's shack and maybe find all the money and make off with it. Mm. Blame the son's dirty rendering me down. Look at my head. Full of sweat. Look, Daddy. Huh? See? Full of sweat. They're near a guard full of sweat come off. Why turn it down that way, Pa? Coming on noon, dinner be most ready. I'm going to tell the snake-loving hoodoo that there's some of them cottonmouths on the creek side of our dead in it. Heck, he knows that. I'm going to tell him he's got my leave to catch him. You don't need to come along. Well, if you're going over to his place, I'd kind of like to see it for my own sake. Him, pa. Huh? He ain't at home. Elsewise, he'd have showed himself by now. I reckon. C- c- can you see any snakes? I told you to keep an eye out for her. I-, I bet it's in one of them chinks, Pa. Pa, I bet the money's in I one ain't of them. I'm looking for no money. <laughs> Must be a dang snake itself, living in a place like this. I know you ain't looking for any money, Pa, but if and you was, wouldn't you look at that the chink right up there? Where? Right there, second log by the fireplace on the right. You see that there hole? Yeah. yeah. I reckon I would look up there. Since we're here... I might as well see for myself. Paul, I wouldn't be a mite surprised if old snake doctor had him. <laughs> Paul? 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 <laughs> Was you looking for something, Jake Marner? Snake doctor? Yeah. I... I was looking for you. I want here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look here, you old hoodoo. What's the idea of sneaking up on folks who's took the trouble to come all the way down here to do you a favor, huh? Uh, come on, Fanny. We getting out of here. Yes, sir. Like as not, they had a dang old moccasin squirching around in his pocket whilst he was talking to you. Daddy, do you mind how his eyes was when he come in? Uh. Do you mind how he kept looking up at the wall where I said I bet he had the money between the chinks? Benny. What? Don't you say nothing to your ma about us being at the snake doctor's place, you understand? Why should well, I? Well, just don't. And don't you go nigh it again. <laughs> Cuss old vomit. You'd have thought we was prowlers way active. Yeah, prowlers. 
Ma, dinner about ready. You pull with you, son? Yeah, I got time enough for dinner to go down the spring and get me some cold water. If you stir your stumps, you can. Catch anything, Jeep? Uh, you think I can catch fish with Fetty fine off my gun at Cottonmouth all the time? Uh, ain't this heat more than a body can bear? Uh, ain't it colder but the creek? Uh, that poor old Miss Rives come by here a spell ago. Might and I shook to pieces with a chill. Oh. He come by, did he? Well, did he come in? Just for a minute. Just for a minute, huh? What'd he want? He wanted to give him some for his ailment. Just about could drag one sob foot before the other. Barely could make it up here from his place. I give him a dose out in our butler's acre drops. Would have given him a little smidgen of liquor, only oh, I could... Oh, you would, huh? Please don't, Jeff. Don't want me. <laughs> don't, Jeff. Don't want me. Just poor old Mr. I. <laughs> Mr. I. Mr. Ives. How many times I gotta tell you that old hoodoo's name is Snake, Doctor? You don't mean nobody no harm. Huh? Hear me to skin a lost with its hide and tallow and you calling him Mr. Ives. Huh. You be calling him Honey and Sugar next. Without I learn you, brother. Please, Jeff, please. Bad names, huh? Well, I aim to... What's his name now? Well? What's your poor Mr. Rives' name now? Sneed, doctor. <laughs> Kizzy Mourner rubbed the ugly red weld on her scrawny arm and gave the frying pan full of sizzling side meat a hopeless nudge. She prayed that time and food might take the edge off Jave's temper. Finney slouched in from the spring, saw the mark on her arm. Pa been whomping you again, Ma? What'd you do this time? She silently dished up the hog back and cornbread for her two men. While they sat at table, she ate on her feet serving them between bites, as was the custom in the Mourner household. After dinner, Finney stretched out under the chinaberry tree. and Kizzy sat on the porch, fanning herself and dipping snuff with a peach twig, scouring it back and forth on her gums. Jafe took his ease on the floor of the back room, but he didn't sleep. The meanness was stirring in him and his hatred of the man he couldn't understand, the man who'd got rich off a of cotton mouse. His mind was working on something he'd seen that day and another thing he'd heard. He was adding them together. That stick could have disappeared under the log jam and the snake doctor's money. It was four o'clock before any of them moved, and then Jafe spoke to his wife for the first time since noon. Is it? Where's that there vial of drinking liquor? By the window. You took it out in your pocket before you laid down. I ought to carry a vial of liquor with me. I might get bit by a moccasin as soon as Pa would. You better not let me catch you. You find it, Jeff? Yeah, I just remembered. I won't be needing to tote no spits along with me while I'm going. I wouldn't take no chance, Jeff. Just one cotton mouth bite. Cotton mouth's all down the slashes, else along a creek. Well, I'll be all this evening's up along Bailey's Ridge in the high ground. You fixing to go shooting? Yeah. Aim to gum me a chance of young squirrels twixt now and dust time. Heard them barking all around me this morning. Reckon I'll come along, Paul. You stay in here, son. Oh, dang it. You'll be steaming in the place when the rain comes down. Paul, you might be needing me just... You stay to... here. Oh, dang it. Kizzy, you set me up a snack of cold supper on the chef. Likely I won't get back till it's plumb dark. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Escape. But first, 
That wonderful variety show with a purpose, CBS's one-hour-long program, This is Broadway, will be round again tomorrow night on most of these same stations. Comedian Abe Burroughs, Broadway playwright George S. Kaufman, Master of Ceremonies Clifton Fadiman will all be here, playing host to the top stars of show business. Hear these top stars and their top acts. Then listen closely as the expert showmen on This is Broadway help them with show business problems. And now, we return to the second act of Escape and tonight's story, Snake Doctor. Jafe Morn had turned north through his struggling corn rolls, and in a minute he was lost from sight. He kept on for nearly a mile till he came to a wild red mulberry tree. Where there are mulberries, there are bound to be squirrels. Very neatly. He shot two young greys. Right through the head. But Jafe was a master marksman. And unsuspected by any who knew him, Jafe had another quality. One that made him more dangerous than the rest of his kind. Jafe had an imagination. Today it was an excellent working order. He tied the brain squirrels together and swung them over his shoulder. If needed, they'd be his alibi. And then he sat down under a tree for a while. Got plenty of time. Don't need to get on the snake doctor's place till about dusk. When he comes out to feed that swayback mare, his and... <laughs> Mr. Ryan. He sat out two brisk thunder showers in the intervals between them. And then he set off in a wide arc down Bailey's branch along the skirts of Little Cypress Slash, down to the sunken flats edge in Cashier Creek. It took more than an hour of careful traveling before he came to his destination. A screen of haw bushes, less than 50 yards behind the snake doctor's cabin. No matter how ailing he is, you'll get up and come out to feed that rack of bones mare. <laughs> Mr. Rice. Well, I'll learn him to go colleaguing around another man's woman. Jafe Mourner let his jealousy heat him to white hatred. At this moment, he was avenging his honor. Didn't admit even to himself that the real reason he was here was a snake doctor's money, hidden behind the log by the fireplace. Home wrecking, snake loving varmint. Well, ten minutes from now, I'll chunk him down a big hole in the creek like I did that stick this morning. And he'll go down and never come up. And nobody will miss him. Nobody will know he's gone for leastwise a week, maybe a month. And maybe if I get around to it, I might come back this way someday. Poke around that cabin of his and just to see if it's true, his having all that money hid away. Jafe Mourner's speculations were cut short. The cabin door opened and a figure stepped out into the growing dusk and walked toward the stable. He saw the snake doctor's loppy old straw hat and his dark coat drawn over a pit. At this distance, he couldn't miss. And he didn't. The figure jerked backward and then went face forward. Jafe started for him, then he stopped. His eyes bugged. His mouth formed a scream that he couldn't utter. His rifle dropped to the ground. He had just killed a snake doctor. Killed him dead with a 32 caliber slug through the head. And there on his door still stood snake doctor, whole and sound, staring at him. Jafe Marner, <sighs> what have you done? <laughs> the scream came at last, for Jafe Mourner had seen the devil. The snake doctor who arose alive from his bullet-riddled body. <laughs> Jafe whirled and ran into the deep darkening woods, whimpering like a whipped puppy as he tore through the brush. Escape. He must escape this, this thing. He must get under the shelter of a sound roof. He must have the protection of four walls around him. He ran and ran for hours. <laughs> It was close to midnight when he came out on a dirt road a short distance southeast of his own land. Beyond the next bend, he'd be inside a home. And then he stopped. Around the bend, coming toward him was a joggling light, a lantern hanging on a buggy. Jake flattened himself in a clump of brush to hide until the traveler passed. And then, just as the rig was opposite him, he heard a call coming from the other direction. Hey, there. Who's jogging? Oh, there. Oh, steady boy. Me, Davis Ware. That you, Tip Bailey? Yes. Hoofed it out from the junction. Tolerable tired. 
What brings you out this time of night, Davis? Somebody sick? Sick nothing. It's been a parcel of trouble of popping in these bottoms tonight. Steady, boy. Steady. Uh, 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 what do you mean? A killing. That's what I mean. You don't say. Who got killed? I'm, uh, I'm uh, fixing to tell you. It happened uh, just around dusk time at down the old snake doctor's place. Yeah? Was it him was killed? Give me time, Tip. It seems like snake doctor's been a-chilling lately. Mm -hmm. It was pretty bad off today, so Miss Kizzy Morner, she footed it down from her place to his and fetching some physic with her and a plate of hot victuals. Hey, mighty thought it, Miss Morner, mighty thought it. You want to hear this? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Go on. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Well, uh, pretty soon after she got there, it seemed like he was tired. And uh, he tried to get up out of his bed to go and feed that old crowbait nag of his. And uh -huh. It uh, started in again by then, pouring down hard. So she made him stay where he was, and she put on his old hat and throwed his old coat around her. And he wanted to keep out of the wet. And no more, and she got outside, and a shot came from the edge of the woods, huh? and down she went with a bullet through her brains. Killed her? Kizzy. It is a dog. It was well, well, but, Kizzy. But who done it? Was that low-flung husband of hers done it? That's who. They shot it was him. Oh, sure thing. Oh, boy. Sure thing, they're certain. Snake doctor jumped up when he heard the shot, and he catched a quick look at Jafe over the fence. Uh -huh. Wasn't a long streak and kiss his arm where he must have whooped her during the day. Why, hanging's a sight too good. Did they catch him? No, but they gonna. Sheriff get there yet? No, but he's due any minute with his pack of hound dogs. Oh. Ray a lot of lay good, ground being damp the way it is. Oh, sure. Old yeah. snake doctor, he's a saying the Lord's going to strike the murder down in his track. Amen. Mm -hmm. But me, uh, I'm a putting my main dependence on them bloodhounds. Oh, poor Miss Marner. She always was a good-hearted, hard-working woman. Kizzy. And mightily put She's upon dead. by that skunk. I kid. shot Kizzy. I th say, did you hear something just then? Can't say I did. Yeah. Oh, probably a rabbit breaking through the brush. Hmm? Listen. Yeah. The sheriffs are coming. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear them hounds are hissing? Oh, just for sure. Oh, I gotta hurry. Uh, Get out, Bessie. Uh, Come uh, on. I I'll see you back at the morning. Oh, you sure uh, will. Jafe didn't waste no time mourning his dead wife. He had a chance against a pack of bloodhounds if he started right away. But Jake's imagination went to work again as it backtracked along the creek bottom in the spotty moonlight. Gotta throw those dogs off the trail. You gotta wade the creek. Even if it is full of cotton mounds. Must be all around me now. Folks say don't strike in the water. Hope them folks is right. Yeah, I've got to get back to the snake doctor's. Get his money while he's still up at my place with Kiz's remains. Get his money and the rest will be easy. I'll make for the deep timber, cross country to the river, make it for tomorrow sundown. Hire me a shanty boater to ferry me to the Arkansas side. He'll get me a haircut and catch me a train for somewhere else. And I gotta get Snake Doctor's money first. Snake Doctor's cabin was dark and empty when Jafe reached it. Only a few dull embers in the fireplace. But he knew where the chink was. He'd find it in the dark. He scrabbled at the logs, felt some bark give, felt the clay mortar crumble under his fingernails. There it was, a hole big enough for a man's arm. He plunged his hand into it, touched something slick and smooth, and then something sharp plunged into his thumb. <laughs> At that moment, the fire flickered to life. Jafe yanked his hand out of the hole, saw two tiny bleeding punctures in his thumb. At the mouth of the hole stretched the wide-open jaws of a cotton mouth. It worked fast. He felt the pain leaping from his thumb to his hand, seeping up his arm. If only he had some liquor. If he had a fresh-killed chicken to slap on the wound, but he had nothing. Then a sharp, horrible pain wrenched his heart, and then a second. And there in the firelight, the huge cotton mouth poised in its crevice. <laughs> Jafe leaped out of the shack, started blindly for the timber. He staggered, stumbled, then he pitched forward on his face, his open mouth full of weeds and muddy grass stems. The cramping fingers of his outstretched right hand almost touched a reddish-black smear on the wet, trampled grass. Good 
riddance by gravy. I'd call it that, wouldn't you, Doc? I reckon there's a sort of rough justice in the way he died. Look, his hand reaching out, just about touching the blood where his woman fell. <laughs> but in all my life, I've never known but two or three people actually was bitten by water moccasins. And until tonight, I've never had personal knowledge of anybody dying from the bite of any kind of snake. Is a fact. Mm -hmm. You know that, we that crazy. I'm going to take that rifle off of you, Fitty Mourner. I'm going to kill the dang reptile and kill my pa. That Mourner's boy kicking up the fuss? Yep, but no good like his pa. Let go of me. I'm my own boss, man. What's the trouble, Tip? Oh, Finny here's went out in his hay. I'm going to kill the snake that bit in my pa. Then I'm going to give that snake doctor a whomping for... Keeping a reptile in this place. Your pa got what was his due, Finney. Snake doctor ain't to blame. He's a hoodoo devil. Look here, boy. Mr. Rives give me all his savings, nearly a hundred dollars, to pay for bearing your mother decent. That's how much he thought of her. Now go on home. Behave yourself. I'm in the get Go it. on, Finney. There ain't no reason for you hanging around here. Somebody ought to kill a reptile a bit in my paw. Doc, just a minute ago you started to say something about... Snake bite not kill him. But how about them two marks on his thumb? Them snakes gashes like some I've seen. No, that don't explain how it... Huh? Oh, it's Finny Mona. He's in the cabin. The fool kid. Come on, Doc. He's probably shot. Yeah, we're too far gone. I shot him. I shot him. But I didn't hear it. It's going to get me like he got my paw. He said he it's shot at something in the cabin. Come on, Doc. Let's go see. All right. We'll <laughs> I don't see anything. Oh, Finney's had enough happen to him yesterday and today to upset even a bright boy. So we can't... Oh, oh. There it is. What? That cotton mouth up there in that hole in the log. Oh, there. Sneak doctor told me about that varmint. Look at him closer, David. Mm, no, sir. Not me. Go ahead. It's just a stuffed snake. Stuffed? Mm-hmm. Sneak doctor believes in precautions because that hole's where he hides his money. That snake would scare away anybody who didn't know it was stuffed. But just to be sure, old snake doctor lined the hole with coils of barbed wire. Oh, I see. You mean them marks on Jafe's thumb was got off the barbed wire? That's right, sir. Lot stronger hearts than Jafe mourners would stop beating at a scare like that. Well, I'll be switched. Old snake doctor's a cute one, ain't he? Escape, produced and directed by Norman McDonald. Tonight brought you Snake Doctor by Irvin S. Cobb, adapted for radio by Fred Howard, starring Bill Conrad as Jafe with Paul Fries as Finney. Featured in the cast were Ira Grossell as a narrator, Bill Lally, Ruth Parrott, Wilms Herbert, and Edgar Barrier. Music is conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Next week, you are groping through the midnight dimness of a gigantic department store. And suddenly you realize that a hundred eyes are staring at you from the shadows and a hundred hands are reaching for your throat and your most urgent desire is to escape. Next week we escape with John Collier's story, Evening Primrose. Be with us next week at the same time when once again we offer you Escape. Ethelbert is at the bar, and Anne and Casey are about to enter on another thrilling crime photographer adventure. Tonight, it's a story entitled Big Danger, and it'll be along on most of these same CBS stations in just a moment. This is John Jacobs speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.